Good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's another V-Day for Australia, another vaccination day. The AstraZeneca vaccine um, has uh, been administered in South Australia and will be rolling out amongst uh, other states uh, over the course of the next few days. Uh, the vaccination program is critical, absolutely critical, uh, to the way that Australia continues to merge uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic and indeed the COVID-19 recession. As I said yesterday, Australia is leading the world out of the COVID-19 pandemic and out of the COVID-19 recession. We saw that with the national accounts figures that were released earlier this week, which puts Australia in the top group of nations, in fact, of advanced economies right at the top in terms of how we're coming out of the COVID-19 recession. But equally, as we've known for, for many months, Australia has also, from a health perspective, been very successful in suppressing the virus here in Australia, particularly when compared to other countries around the world. Australia uh, is in a very unique position. It's a position all Australians have worked hard to achieve, to ensure that we are in uh, the situation we are in today. National Cabinet has played a key role in all of these achievements, in all of these successes. And National Cabinet met again today in what was once again a very constructive meeting. At all times in the National Cabinet, what we've sought to do is to chart the way forward. Of course, we come up against obstacles, we come up against issues that we have to deal with. There's been plenty of surprises too along the way which have required responses at the time. But at all times what we seek to try and do is ensure we're doing this on as nationally consistent basis as possible, not always achieved, but we also understand the principles that should drive how we open up. Now the good news is, is that we are opening up. We are far more open than we were. Um, we want to stay open though, that's the key to the confidence in the economic recovery that we're seeing coming out of the COVID-19 recession. And so today it was agreed um, on the work that we commenced a month ago uh, that the Directors General of all the Premier's Department and the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister's Cabinet will continue to do the work to inform National Cabinet on how the risks are changing and the data that is needed to be provided to Premiers and myself and Chief Ministers to ensure the decisions we're making about whatever future further opening up and removing of restrictions um, is done in a consistent way that looks not just at the health issues that are relevant, but of course the impacts that are had more widespread on the economy. Now the reason there is more opportunity to do that now, particularly when it comes to the economy, is because of the improvements we're seeing with the rollout of the vaccine, uh, the improvements we're seeing in terms of the health outcomes right across the country. That gives us further opportunity to grave give greater certainty and greater confidence to business and Australians all around the country so they can return to as much of the normal life as they possibly can. We also received an update on the vaccination rollout today and I'm going to ask uh, Professor Murphy who's joining us today uh, to give us um, his update on those programs. Uh, you would have already heard today from Minister Hunt about the issues that were raised earlier today. Um, that program is on track. Um, it's a it's a significant program of a scale that we have not seen in this country before and everybody is working together to ensure that we can deliver those vaccines all around the country. Forward distribution plans for the vaccines, uh, the progress that we're making with aged care, uh, the enabling regulation which is important to uh, support pharmacists to be able to play their role in the vaccination program all addressed today. Of course the Chief Medical Officer has always updated us on the uh, on the health situation around the country and some of the current issues. Uh, on uh, Pacific workers, um, we've been able to put in place a, a pre-travel quarantine pilot. Now only South Australia at this point has indicated they're keen to join in with that program, but other states are considering it. Uh, this is the situation where out of countries such as Vanuatu and Fiji, where they do actually run quarantine programs, uh, that there'll be an opportunity to quarantine post-travel to Australia as part of the seasonal worker program. Um, and uh, that is something that's been particularly worked through with the Chief Medical Officer and I want to thank him and also DFAT for the work they've done working with those jurisdictions. Today I can also announce that the Commonwealth is entering into an agreement with the Northern Territory Government to further expand our Howard Springs National Resilience Quarantine Facility um, to 2,000, up from 850. And that will be done um, over the next few months uh, and that is an important addition to the capacity of those quarantine facilities to receive those return chartered flights that Australia has been putting in place now for many, many months and that's where will, people will quarantine. Uh, the other arrival caps uh, remain as, <coughs> as uh, we had them before. I want to thank New South Wales in particular are taking more than 3,000 a week. 
uh, both Western Australia and uh, Queensland are also now back over 1,000 per week and South Australia at 530. And I'm looking forward soon uh, to a decision from the Victorian Government uh, once they're in a position to advise us of when they'll be also in a position to take flights again. So all in all, a rather routine meeting of the National Cabinet today, um, uh, considering the information before us, setting the chart, uh, charting a way forward in terms of how we can keep Australia open and, and seek to do that on a far more consistent and a predictable basis because that lies at the heart of our economic recovery as well. So with that I'll hand you over to the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Kelly, and then I'll hand you over to Professor Murphy. Thank you. Uh, thank you PM. So uh, a couple of slides uh, up on the screen, maybe go through to the next slide. Um, so we have a visual representation of where we're at in terms of uh, the epidemic here in Australia. And so uh, we're used to hearing the total numbers since the beginning of the, of the pandemic uh, when we had our first, first cases uh, at the end of January last year. Uh, so we're up over 29,000 cases, 909 Australians have lost their lives. Um, but I, I think it's time now as we go into 2021 and as the PM has mentioned, looking at the way we chart our way out of this pandemic, both from the health and the economic perspective, uh, that we should start thinking about what's happened this year rather than the whole of the pandemic. So, so since uh, the 1st of January, there's been 600 cases uh, of COVID-19 in Australia and only 104 of those have been locally acquired. Um, so the vast majority of overseas cases and in fact in the last week of the 60 cases we've had they have all been overseas acquired cases similar to the very start of the pandemic. Um, we've had less uh, throughout the whole of this year to date we've had less than 20 people in hospital, less than one, one or less people in ICU and zero deaths. Contrast that with the, with the rest of the world. Let's go to the next slide, thanks. Uh, where increase, there, there is increasing cases uh, still in many parts of the world. Uh, there are some very encouraging signs in, some, uh, in Europe and North America where uh, cases have started to decrease, um, hospitalizations have started to decrease, and, and deaths have started to decrease. But even so, year to date, so from 1st of January to, uh, to today, over 33 million cases in the world and over 765,000 deaths. Um, my, my sister lives in, in Italy. They, they're they're um, at the moment having 18,000 cases a day uh, and around 300 deaths uh, in Italy. Um, so, we're, of course, we're in an excellent place here, here in Australia. We continue to look at the rest of the world, particularly the emergence of, emergence of uh, variants of concern uh, and, of and also what is happening in the vaccine rollout and what effect that's having uh, on hospitalisations and, and Professor Murphy will talk about that uh, shortly. Uh, but that's something we need to keep in, in mind as we go through this year. What is it about the vaccine rollout where, when we get to certain uh, levels of vaccination around the country? country uh, that we can start to look at our public health um, uh, baselines and also reactions uh, to outbreaks as they occur and they, they may well occur uh, as we go through particularly into winter and that's the information that myself and, the, and my colleagues on the Australian Health Protection Committee uh, will be giving into that, uh, that uh, process that the Prime Minister has outlined already. Um, so I'll pass over to, to Dr Murphy now to talk about the vaccine rollout. Thanks Brendan. Thanks, PM. Um, so this huge once in a generation logistical challenge of the vaccine rollout is going well. We've just come into the end of week two. We're ramping up. We've started carefully and progressively across Australia as we can do because we are in such a good place as my colleague has already outlined. We don't have a burning platform. We have time to do this properly and carefully. Just to remind you, we have two very, very good vaccines. A year ago, we wouldn't have dreamt that we could have two vaccines that are so good. And it's important to emphasise that all of the data, particularly coming out of the UK and other places, is showing that these two vaccines are both equally excellent, particularly in all age groups. So we know we've got two vaccines. We've got the Pfizer vaccine, which we've now had two weeks of experience with, and we've had our first AstraZeneca vaccination today. We've got 300,000 doses of AstraZeneca from international sources. That is being rolled out now and will start up in every state next week. 
and we'll also be starting up vaccinating some aged care workers. But the really, really exciting thing is that in the week beginning the 22nd of March, we'll start to release the onshore supply of AstraZeneca vaccine, a million doses plus a week, which gives us the capacity to really ramp up and broadly vaccinate our population as quickly as possible. The value of having onshore production cannot be underestimated. Every country in the world that's depending on international supplies is seeing them come slowly. We have been very lucky with Pfizer. They have kept their supply going, but it's relatively small volumes and that will keep going throughout the rest of this year. And that will be a very valuable vaccine, but we'll get a lot more of the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's the one I'm going to have and I'm really looking forward to it. Next slide. This is the sort of reporting that we discussed at National Cabinet today that we will start to put out initially weekly and then progressively daily. The data on this slide still have to be verified, but they're pretty indicative of our situation as of the end of the day yesterday. We've, all, we've seen well over 70,000 vaccinations, 241 residential aged care facilities uh, and disability care facilities have been vaccinated with well over 20,000 residents. They're protected with their first dose now. That is a fantastic thing. And the states and territories have all been ramping up progressively with their Pfizer clinics. Many of them have nearly completed or have completed those quarantine and border workers who are protecting us in the quarantine hubs. From They're the people at highest risk because they're the ones who are in contact with the only people in Australia at the moment who have COVID, the return travellers. Also in phase 1A, as you all know, the phases now, we've been vaccinating those frontline healthcare workers, emergency department workers, ICU staff and the like. With the AstraZeneca doses being rolled out by the states and territories and by the Commonwealth next week, we will be starting to vaccinate a broader range of healthcare workers. And then in that week beginning the 22nd of March, between the 22nd and 29th of March, we will start to vaccinate the more vulnerable pe people in our general population, the older Australians, the over 80s and the over 70s. And that is when we will be rolling out to general practices. Progressively, over the course of a month, we'll be rolling out to over 4,600 general practices in Australia uh, where people can go to get their vaccines as close to their home as possible. This is again a huge logistical exercise and I want to pay absolute credit to the mm -hmm. medical bo bodies who've worked with us closely, the states and territories who've worked with us, our logistics providers who will be de delivering vaccines to so many sites across the country. This is a very exciting time. We're on track, we're doing well and we're going to keep ramping up and get this community vaccinated as soon as we can. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Now, um, because I'm joined by Professor Murphy and Kelly today, I'd be grateful if we could deal with matters that uh, relate to their responsibilities and the National Cabinet, and then happy to move to other matters. And at that time, I'll ask Professors Kelly and Murphy to, to leave us. Prime Minister, can you blame the Italian authorities blocking Yeah, well, well, they're certainly responsible for uh, exercising the, the, the veto right they had through the EU process about those supplies coming to Australia. But the point about that is, is that we'd always anticipated um, that these sorts of problems could arise. And that's why we've done a number of things, the most significant of which is to ensure that we have our own domestically produced vaccine. And uh, we're one of few countries that have done that. And that means that give, has given us sovereignty uh, over our vaccination program, which I think is incredibly important. I mean, I'm in regular contact with European leaders. As, as Professor Kelly said, in Italy, people are dying at the rate of 300 a day. And so I can certainly understand the high level of anxiety that would exist in Italy and, and in many countries are, are across Europe, um, as, as is regularly conveyed to me. Um, and so they have some real difficulties there. They are in a and an unbridled crisis situation. That is not the situation in Australia, but nevertheless, we've been able to secure our supplies um, and additional supplies for importation, both with Pfizer and AstraZeneca, which means we can continue the rollout of our program. So I want to assure Australians that uh, 
we've been able to secure those vaccines. Uh, the, this particular shipment was not one we'd counted on um, for the rollout, and uh, so we will continue unabated. Well, yes, I did, and, and we have regularly uh, made that request, and the Premier advised me today that he, he hopes to soon be able to um, provide a response to that. He wasn't in a position to do that today. Um, Jane Holden, who's the, who did the work uh, at our request uh, uh, for the quarantine review uh, for the National Cabinet, has recently been in Victoria and, uh, and observed the practices they have firsthand, and she's given a positive report about that. And so we look forward to Victoria resuming that as soon as possible, because that will obviously add to the ability for, to bring Australians home. I mean, the second highest number of Australians on that list uh, are from Victoria, over 10,000. Uh, Victorians are wanting to come home, so I'm sure they would welcome uh, their home state receiving those flights as soon as possible. So I'll go here and then I'll go there. Uh, when will we see that increase in capacity at Howard Springs? <coughs> mm. uh, look, we anticipate we're, we're currently at around 850, um, and there are wet season issues that we're currently dealing with, and so we would expect that to occur around April, May. Now, is there any reason for delay, or why that? No, it's the ramp up of workforce. That's a critical issue. Um, but there's also wet season issues as well. Prime Minister, the Northern Territory willing to more than double their capacity at the Howard Springs facility. Was there any uh, thought given to other states increasing their capacity or changing where their locations will be? I know Queensland has previously spoken about going regional. Well, no, the, the, the hotel quarantine arrangements um, have always worked most effectively where, where they're close to the major airports where the flights are coming. And I think this is a very important point. The flights go to where they're designated to go. Australia can't just redirect flights, commercial flights of, of, of airlines, uh, to go to other ports where they don't have the ground crew and the other supports that, that go to supporting the aviation industry. Uh, oftentimes that includes the, the freight and other things that are in the belly of the plane itself. And so it's not a, just a matter of, of a plane flying somewhere else. The Howard Springs facility was set up on the recommendation of Jane Holden's review, and we acted on that recommendation. And that was to support uh, the supplementary um, quarantine capacity that was needed by our charter flights, that, which the Australian government is, is putting on, where we can direct those things. And so that gives us greater capacity to respond to that. Um, we're, happy to look at other, other, other issues, but we need firm costed proposals for that, and I have no such firm costed proposals. Prime Minister, earlier this week, uh, New South Wales, the uh, Health Minister and also the Premier criticised the Federal Government for not releasing data fast enough in relation to the aged care uh, facilities that were getting vaccination. Mm. Uh, are you in talks with New South Wales about increasing that? Well, we have. And I stress, though, this. The, the aged care vaccinations are run by the federal government. Um, they're not run by the state government, but we're happy to share the information about how the federal program is, is rolling out into those aged care facilities. And today, not only did all the states and territories receive a full list of all the facilities that have been visited, but they also received an indicative planning list for next week's as well. So look, that's part of the flow of information in the early stages of, uh, of the vaccine rollout. I mean, one of the points that uh, uh, Professor Murphy was just saying, you've seen up there the, uh, the indicative um, weekly report that we provided. We agreed that that should be done on a Monday um, with the data uh, to the seven days to the end of the Sunday of the previous day. And we want to take that to a, a daily level ultimately. But at this stage, while the, the data flows are, are still being uh, confirmed between the states and the territories and the Commonwealth, then we're confident about that, uh, that weekly picture. Um, and, uh, and we hope to move fairly quickly to daily. I think those daily reports will give uh, Australians a lot of confidence uh, about the success of the rollout. The, the network of 4,600 uh, GPs, uh, is, that, is that sufficient uh, or would you need the state health authorities Brennan? Sure. So um, the, the Premier here is obviously very keen to roll out as many GP practices as possible. Uh, we have uh, planned around the 4,600 on the basis of the availability of sufficient dose to be able to give them at least 50 doses a week to deliver. You really can't run a vaccination service with less than that. If we get more 
vaccine supplies, uh, which we are working with, working with CSL to see whether we can get more production. <coughs> uh, we might, we still, as the Prime Minister said, are working to get more international supplies. We may well be having additional vaccination sites and in phase two, some community pharmacies will also come on board. But the states and territories are running AstraZeneca vaccination clinics. They'll focus mainly on their healthcare workers, the broader range initially, but they will also uh, provide some community vaccination. To f it's a partnership between the Commonwealth and the states. We're all in this together. And I, I should stress too that it, it, the blocks it moves in, I mean, in, in the early phases you're dealing with um, hotel quarantine workers and they're working through those. You're dealing with uh, vulnerable people in aged care, uh, aged care workers. When you get to the balance of the population, which is you know, people sitting in this room, for example, um, then there will be in a, in a completely different phase where, where others will be involved in that process and can support it. Um, but one of the issues that I'd raise is this is not the same as doing flu vaccinations. And, and there's often a comparison made, I think, in the analysis of this. It's not the same thing. It is a very different exercise. And that's why the Commonwealth has taken such a direct role in this. And uh, the strategy that was formulated for the rollout and agreed last year is the one that we're proceeding with. Prime Minister, um, have you talked to your uh, EU counterparts about getting that shipment to be watched? Will they or have it had any luck on that front? Oh, I've had quite a few conversations, as has the Foreign Minister and the Health Minister and others, in engaging with our EU counterparts on, on these matters over some time. Have you made a handful of new cases diagnosed in CAN overnight in hotel quarantine? They've all been linked back to a copper mine in CND. Mm. Are you confident with the border situation between CND and the Torres Strait? We discussed this today, and, uh, and Border Force in particular has a very significant presence in that part of, of Australia, as you'd expect them to. It's, uh, it's, it's actually the closest border we have to, to land uh, of, of anywhere around uh, the, Australia. Um, that particular case, I'll, I might ask Professor Kelly to, to comment on, because he's closer to the details of it, but can I assure you that, the, uh, as we were able to do with the Premier today, um, that uh, our focus on those border controls is, is very strong. So there's no plan if that is necessary, then that will be done. Premier Sorry, I'll go to... Yeah, so, so just on, on, on that matter, so I had a very detailed discussion with Jeanette Young, my counterpart in, in uh, <coughs> Queensland yesterday, about the Torres Strait. Uh, it's been a point of concern for, for, for uh, quite some time throughout this pandemic and what's uh, happening in PNG. So we're, of course, assisting PNG on the ground through the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade. In terms of the Torres Strait itself, that's a partnership with, with the Queensland Government mm -hmm. in relation to vaccination, for example, um, and the ABF presence there, as the Prime Minister said, has been uh, up upgraded over, over time. But that, that, that will be a key component of their AstraZeneca rollout uh, to the Torres Strait, and we're working through with the elders of, that, of the, those areas to make sure that happens. Well, on international borders, generally, it was uh, from a very different intention to lay back today in terms of this and discussion do so, and is there any agreement between uh, Well, there's no disagreement amongst any of the Premiers or the Chief Ministers about the, uh, the closure of international borders and, and the, the current arrangements we have for that, which extends out to the end of June. That is a, a unanimous position. Um, the discussion we had today about how we get open, stay open, um, is really about how we inform those choices in response to any events that may occur along the way. Um, what I want to see, and I know that New South Wales Premier wants to see, uh, is that we fully realise the capability of our national economy, reconnecting all of our states and territories. And there's been a lot of progress then on that in the last few months. Uh, we've seen more of, the, more of the Commonwealth open up over these last few months. And we want to see that stay that way and not fall back. And there is every reason to have the confidence of that uh, as the vaccination program continues, as the, uh, the success um, right across the country of the, of the quarantine program continues. I mean, even in the very serious cases that you've just mentioned up in involving uh, the, the mine, I mean, that's been contained within the quarantine. And that has largely been the experience of Australia throughout the entire pandemic. And when you think about the, the hundreds of thousands of people who've gone through hotel quarantine and the very small number of cases um, that it's failed to contain. And that is a success rate that any other country in the world 
um, would swap places for in a heartbeat. Um, so, you know, we share that view about wanting to open up, but at this stage, uh, opening up to international arrivals at that scale is not considered uh, safe um, or, or wise. Prime Minister, can we ask some questions now? Not... Well, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to get to those, but I'm going to deal with the issues of the National Cabinet first. Yeah. Prime Minister, is there any update on the no, I still don't have one. That's the update I have. Um, I, I need a detailed costed proposal that the Commonwealth could consider. There's been a lot of going backwards and forwards, but as yet the Commonwealth doesn't have a, a costed proposal that we could actually consider. Just on the overseas shipments, um, we're meant to be getting more than 3 million doses um, from overseas. Are we still relying on those at all? Or so we have those 300,000, which will really take us through at our current rate. Uh, we plan to use them until the CSL local production comes. We are still working and still expect to get those other 3.8 million, and we may yet get more in coming weeks. And if we get some more in coming weeks, we will obviously ramp up the pre-local production release phase of the AstraZeneca. So we can scale <coughs> our vaccination program according to what we have at the moment. At the moment, we've deployed 200,000 doses right throughout the country to states and territories, and they're, they're about to stand up clinic next week. If we get more, they can do more. So it's all scalable, and we've got the time to do it. Prime Minister, the ripping up of hotel quarantine invoices by some states, uh, mm. It's a matter for them. That's what I make of that. It's not a matter for the Commonwealth. It's a matter for the states to resolve those matters between themselves. We're all in this together, aren't we? Well, if they've, if they've got outstanding invoices between states, I'm sure they can work that out. I don't think they need my help to do that. Prime Minister, just uh, on the international uh, borders, is there any update with foreign students? Is that something that uh, we're any closer to seeing? No, there's no change on, on that front. Um, it would be good if we could get to that point, but at this stage we're not at that point. Um, the opening of the international borders we, we don't think is, is wise uh, at this time and, and for the period that we've suggested, and that's totally consistent with the medical advice. And we've always been happy to work with the international education sector uh, if they want to um, put in place supplementary self-funded quarantine arrangements and flight arrangements. That that has always been there for the international education industry, the large universities and others to go down that path. Um, they haven't chosen to go down that path. Uh, our focus has remained on, on the responsibilities we have as a Commonwealth. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, notwithstanding our onshore vaccine capacity, mm. uh, are you worried about vaccine nationalism going forward and is the incident in Italy overnight an example? Yeah, look, vaccination nationalism or protectionism is, is a matter that has been regularly raised in, in the national forums that I've been involved with. It's, it's a matter I discussed um, with Ursula von der Leyen when, when I discussed this particular matter. Uh, it's fair to say that uh, the European Union um, has seen uh, a large amount of vaccines leave the European Union, so it would be unfair to suggest that they've engaged um, in a universal practice of that nature. Um, but obviously, um, you know, it's important that contracts are honoured. Um, it's important that the vaccines uh, not only reach uh, across Europe and, and uh, in North America, uh, but particularly in the developed world as well. Uh, I, I, I've been so impressed by the way that the Pacific Islands uh, nations have, have performed during this pandemic and keeping their citizens safe. Uh, up in Papua New Guinea now, it's a, it's a more distressing situation that has deteriorated somewhat. Um, but frankly, the fact they've been able to maintain um, the position they have for so long is a, is a great credit to Prime Minister Marape and the work that they've done there. So yes, it is a real issue. Um, it is a, is a matter that I think particularly advanced countries have to be quite vigilant about. And it's certainly a matter that I've raised very consistently, particularly for access for vaccines to those in the Pacific Islands family and, uh, and Southeast Asia. Professor Murphy, can you give an outline of what role specifically, has it been finalised, what role the military will play in the vaccine rollout and how many medical professionals or nurses they have on hand to assist in that role? So uh, it's, a, it's a relatively minor role. There's a team of about 60 um, ADF personnel who are clinically trained. Uh, mostly nurses and and, uh, and paramedic-style trained people. They 
we're standing up teams anyway to vaccinate the Defence Forces and what we've done is ask them to stand up a bit earlier to help with the aged care rollout. As you've obviously been aware, aged care rollout has been a bit more complex than we thought and we need to supplement it, particularly in those parts of the country where sending a contracted team uh, it might be difficult. The ADF have the capacity to get anywhere and do anything. So it's a relatively small contribution. It's not taking any health professionals away from any state and territory health services, not using reservists. It's just the Defence Force, as they have done throughout this pandemic, mm. stepping up to help. Mm. OK. Well, on that note, I'm, thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Paul. Happy to deal with other matters.